Welcome, welcome everyone. This is a Beam Exchange Grab the Mic webinar. Um, and today we're going to be talking about get started, or we're going to give you an encouragement to get started on assessing system change. And uh, I'm going to hand over to Ali Milbrad uh, from Milbrad Consulting Limited, who is really one of the lead authors of this whole process. And she's going to talk us through how to get started on assessing system change. Ali, over to you. Thanks, Mike. We need a pragmatic approach to assessing system change because program teams in the field need information on system change regularly to manage adaptively and to implement effectively. The resources pictured here on a pragmatic approach to assessing system change grew out of workshops in 2019 and 2021 with experienced MRM practitioners. I want to thank SDC, the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and the DCAD for sponsoring the workshops and the learning products that came out of them. Assessing system change starts with defining the system change the program aims to have. And that means setting clear boundaries for the system the program targets, geographical boundaries, the target group, and the main and supporting systems the program aims to influence. This example shows the PRISMA program's boundaries for its work in maize in Indonesia. Then the program outlines a strategy with a clear description of the current system state and how the program envisions it will change. And this sets the stage for assessing system change. Effective assessment uses two lenses. The intervention lens tracks wider influence from individual interventions. For example, seed suppliers crowding in. And the helicopter lens takes a top-down look at the changes that are happening in the main and supporting systems and why they're happening. For example, looking at changes in sales of high quality maize. Then using this information, a program can compare the starting state of the system with the current state of the system and the desired state of the system and analyze why changes are happening. And this analysis helps the team decide how to adapt their strategy to be more relevant and effective. So with that framing, I wanna emphasize that today we're not looking at how to assess system change perfectly. We're focusing on how to get started with real experiences and tips from three practitioners who face very similar challenges as you. So let me introduce them and their programs. Farzana Amin is the MRM and Knowledge Management Manager for Prabridi. Prabridi is a local economic development project funded by Switzerland and the government of Bangladesh. And it's co-implemented. Uh, the project aims to improve the economic competitiveness of their partner municipalities in Bangladesh. It's co-implemented by Swiss Contact and the local government divisions. The project's inception phase started in 2018 and its main phase in 2020. Ritesh Prasad is the deputy team leader and MRM director for Grow Liberia. Grow is an agribusiness and investment advisory program with partners with businesses, investors, associations, and government agencies to accelerate inclusive economic growth. Grow uses an MSD approach and currently focuses on the cocoa and vegetable sectors in Liberia. The program has been in operation for eight years and is coming to an end this month is funded by CEDA and implemented by Adam Smith International. Isla Villagorak is the Quality and Inclusion Director for the Market Development Facility. MDF is a private sector development program connecting individuals, businesses, government, and NGOs with each other and with markets, stimulating investment and inclusive economic growth. It's supported by the Australian and New Zealand governments and implemented by Palladium and Swiss Contact. MDF started in Fiji 10 years ago, and the program is now operating in eight countries across the Indo-Pacific region. So we're going to learn about how to start assessing system change from these amazing practitioners through a panel discussion. 
And I'd like Isla to start us off by telling us about MDS work in the sugarcane in Fiji. Thank you, Ali. This is Isla from MDF. Um, just briefly to get a sense of what we wanted to do, MDF's target group were um, smallholder sugarcane farmers. Um, however, Fiji was not competitive in global sugarcane market and relied on a low margin bulk commodity market. Thus, farmers were getting uh, low returns. Our systemic change vision or our systemic change objective was to assist Fiji sugar sector shift from bulk commodity market to premium markets. However, that growth was uh, ultimately hampered by, by the inappropriate, imp inappropriate inputs that farmers were using, mechanizations, and lack, overall lack of value addition and marketing of the end product. Thus, MDF has introduced business models that firstly allowed private sector to profitably supply affordable inputs and mechanization to farmers to incur yield growth and cost savings. And at the same time, subsequent, subsequent interventions have focused on value addition marketing to fetch higher premiums in the international markets. Thank you all. Thanks, Isla. So why did MDF start assessing system change? Thank you, Ali. This is again Isla. So uh, there were two main reasons. Firstly, understanding what's happening in the system uh, with or without MDF. That has assisted us to make better decisions on which innovations or which interventions to start. Second, uh, MDF's theory of change was that innovations that we had introduced in the market will increase productivity, decrease costs, and fetch premiums. So we ultimately wanted to assess, assess if those assumptions hold true. And there was also a need to assess how those innovations that we have introduced um, interlink or intersupport each other and what type of system change or what type of wider market changes they're making and why is that happening? Thank you. Great. So Farzana, I am very interested to hear why Prabriti started to assess system change. But first, tell me a little bit about Prabriti's approach in Bangladesh. Thanks, Eddie. Hi, everyone. This is Farzana uh, from Prabriti. Greetings from Bangladesh and thanks for joining us today. First, uh, let me introduce the project that I am representing. The name of our project is Probriddhi, which means growth. So why are we doing local economic development? In Bangladesh, uh, rapid urbanization has been taking place since last 15 years. However, not all regions has progressed at the same speed or in the same manner. And Bangladesh plans to address this problem through effective decentralization process and there, uh, local economic development model comes into play. Through this model, Probridhi is supporting the partner municipalities to improve their economic competitiveness. Uh, we start the process with stakeholder formation. You can see a visualization of the process on your screen. Uh, the municipal bodies are the host of this process at the local level. Together with them, we work with the local business associations, uh, private enterprises, government line agencies, civil society organizations, and others to identify their problems and opportunities and how we can address them by implementing some quick wins together with them. Uh, later experts are also engaged for developing more longer term and uh, strategic interventions. And at the end, LED or local economic development strategy is prepared, which has been developed through this uh, participatory and iterative process. Uh, this process at one end creates more ownership at the local level. And on the other, it also develops the capacities of the local stakeholders uh, so that they continue implementing this model beyond the project. We have also identified uh, that uh, there are five major elements which drive the local economic development process. Uh, you can see these uh, drivers on the screen, we call them local economic development drivers. Uh, these drivers are local governance, potential of the priority sector, supporting functions and structures, infrastructure and human resources. Uh, 
So strengthening of these drivers ensure uh, sustainability of the local economic development model. And as a result, more jobs, income, and improved living standard is created uh, in those municipalities. So that was about Prabhidhi in a nutshell. Over to you, Ali. Great, thanks a lot, Farzana. So why has Prabhidhi started to assess system change even quite early in your program? Right. So uh, Prabhidhi is exploring a model which is um, comparatively new for Bangladesh. And I would say we are a bit premature to answer uh, questions like uh, scale, sustainability, resilience. Uh, nevertheless, we have started thinking about systemic change or system change from the very beginning, um, especially for shaping the strategies and designing the interventions. At a broad level, we want to find answers to the key questions like, what are the drivers of local economic development in Bangladesh? And how do these local economic development initiatives um, transform the economic and governance system in a municipality over time? So that is why we started assessing or thinking about system change even at this early stage. And can you share an example of how that information has already helped you to develop an adapter strategy? Right, yes. Uh, to answer this question, I will uh, refer to the pentagon of drivers that was shown on the screen earlier. So we, we have five drivers, which we divide into sub drivers and then indicators that we can mo then monitor throughout the process. So when we uh, visit a municipality, we try to explore how efficient they are in their delivery of services. Efficient delivery of services, uh, is an important sub driver under the main uh, driver called local governance. So in most of the municipalities of Bangladesh, we observe that the services are delivered manually without any computer or digital payments in place. The citizens have to go from one desk to another to collect required information and visit the municipality multiple times uh, for getting desired services. This creates inefficiency both for the municipality and the citizens. And this problem can be solved through digitization of uh, municipal services and setting up one-stop service centers at the municipality. So from this analysis of the drivers, we can immediately understand that you, improvement of municipal services is a key strategic area for local economic development. Over to you, Ali. Thanks, Farzana. Isla, many programs are struggling with their activities during COVID-19. Can you give an example of how you've used the information on system change in MDF to help you ensure that MDF has maximized the impact of its interventions during COVID? Thank you, Ali. Again, this is Isla from MDF. Um, so I will take you through the story of COVID-19 um, over the last two years. So after the initial breakout of covid and it's slowing down. Um, Fiji has managed to somewhat contain COVID cases. And this, thus the economy has started um, reviving or growing again. The local economic transactions have start, restarted happening. However, we also noticed that the economy was not behaving as usual. Uh, we noticed that significant uh, international um, shortages were also quite impacting the, the Fijian economy. So for example, when a cargo would come in the market, there was an increase of economic activity. So we needed to understand better the patterns, why they're happening, but also how to take advantage of it. So for example, uh, we knew that Fiji's reopening will be during December, 2021 and that it would pose as a great opportunity for an effective revival of tourism, which has been pretty much um, dead in the last two years. So three months before um, the team, the tourism team, uh, Fiji team has done a market research on what kind of tourists would be likely the, fir uh, the first to arrive and what is their actually uh, profile. Uh, that enabled the team to effectively make a decision, work with the industry and develop a targeted marketing campaign versus a broad marketing campaign that campaign that would have appealed to a bigger group, but would have been significantly less effective. Thank you, Ali. 
So if I understand correctly, Isla, you're saying that MDF was keeping an eye on what was happening in the system, not necessarily only because of MDF, but what was happening as a result of COVID and all the various things it created in the economy. And that actually helped you to improve the relevance and the timing of the interventions that you had going. Great, thanks. Ritesh, I'm just interested to hear what information GROW needed on system change. But first, can you tell me a little bit about GROW's cocoa sector strategy in Liberia? Uh, thanks, Ali. Hi, everyone. This is Rites from Grow Liberia. Uh, there are about 30,000 farming households in Liberia that uh, rely on cocoa as their main source of income. However, they were getting low and unreliable prices for their cocoa because all of their cocoa was sold in the global market as bulk or conventional cocoa. Gross aim in, uh, in the cocoa sector was to shift the Liberian cocoa sales from bulk to premium market so that exporters get a higher price and they're in a position to pay smaller holder farmers higher price. And that would in incentivize uh, quality improvement in the long run. However, when we started working in the cocoa sector, Liberia was known to be producing very poor quality cocoa and premium buyers were not interested in buying uh, those cocoa. The cocoa sector was also fragmented with weak relationships amongst uh, market actors. Gross started uh, working closely with the producer groups, traders, exporters to put systems in place that meets premium market requirements, uh, build the capacity of exporters and prepare them for trade and also link them up with the premium buyers. Thanks, Al. So you had a clear picture of the system change that Grow was trying to influence and promote, shifting cocoa from the bulk market to the premium market. And so what yeah. information did GROW actually want to get on system change? Uh, in our strategy, we wanted to see a shift, like you said, from uh, selling from bulk to premium markets. Therefore, we needed uh, information on um, how Liberian cocoa was sold, in, like how much Liberian cocoa was sold in bulk market versus how much it was sold in premium markets, how it was changing over time and uh, why. Uh, we also wanted to know how many exporters were selling uh, in the premium market and if that was changing over time and why. Uh, making a shift from bulk to premium market required five key changes in the sector. Farmers needed to apply good agriculture practices to produce better quality cocoa uh, that's needed by the premium market. Exporters needed to invest in uh, systems like organic certification or traceability systems that meets premium market requirements. Central processing was needed to improve post harvest handling and standardize the quality of cocoa, which was mostly needed by the fine flavor and specialty market, which is the highest paying market for, for the cocoa. Exporters also needed to invest in branding, marketing, and be prepared uh, or be export ready for, uh, for transactions with premium markets. And finally, we also needed a regulatory environment that promotes sales uh, to premium market. So basically the information we needed on, so basically we needed information on to what extent, why, and how these changes were happening. For example, we wanted to understand exporters' investment in their supply chains to improve the quality and establishment of uh, systems for premium market. We wanted to understand how relationships were changing among exporters, traders, uh, farmer groups, and farmers, as these relationships were key to the whole chain producing quality and traceable cocoa in Liberia. And we wanted information on these changes, not just for our partners, but for other market ex, uh, actors as well. Uh, we also wanted to understand how the regulatory environment of the cocoa exports was changing and what was driving those changes. So I would say basically the information we wanted on the system change was actually tied to the changes we had aimed to promote in the cocoa sector. So you you took directly from your strategy from the main cocoa market change and those five changes that you said, and that gave you the information that you needed looking at those changes and the interlinkages among them. And how have you yes. actually used the information on system change that you've gathered? Uh, thanks, Ellie. That's, that's a really good question. I would say we have used the information mostly to make sure that the program remained on track to facilitate sales to the premium market. And this, of course, led to new support areas over the life of the program. Uh, for example, initially, when we started, we were just focusing on training of farmers on good agriculture practices 
and on trying to strengthen, strengthen the relationship between producer groups, traders, and exporters. But then uh, we realized that some farmers were improving the quality of their cocoa, but they were not getting higher prices. So their motivation for producing quality in long run was going down. Uh, we also realized that exporters' sales to premium market was not happening, and exporters were not getting higher price, which basically then explained why there was no price increase to farmers, even uh, they were producing better quality cocoa. When we further investigated why sales to premium market was not happening, uh, we realized that exporters needed to put uh, more systems in place uh, that were required by the premium markets. And some of these includes uh, systems like traceability systems, uh, going for certification or even investing in central processing. So what we basically did, we supported some of them uh, to put these systems in place. Uh, later on uh, in the life of the program, we also added in uh, investment promotion as a new intervention area. Uh, under investment promotion, we supported our partners uh, with, expo with branding and marketing activities. And we also built their capacity for trade with premium markets. And those were, who were ready in time, we linked them up with the uh, international premium buyers. So I would say initially, uh, one part of the system, quality of cocoa was changing, but the main change that we were aiming for was not happening, which was sales to the premium market. So by regular monitoring and by adjusting or revising our strategy in a timely manner, we were able to remain on track and uh, I would say effectively promote sales to the premium market. Thanks, Ali. So the information on system change on what was happening and what was not happening was clearly critical for GROW in ensuring its strategy was both relevant and effective as you move through the program. Farzana, you mentioned that Prabriti needs this kind of information as well, particularly as the program moves from piloting to scaling up. How did you and Prabriti develop your approach to assessing system change during the pilot of Prabriti? Um, thanks, Ali. So honestly, it has been and still is a, a process of trial and error. Uh, during the inception phase, we were figuring out the process through which the local stakeholders can identify, design, and implement local economic development initiatives. However, in doing so, we were ending up with lots of information and perspectives. Uh, we needed to structure this information for uh, you know, translating this information into strategies and intervention ideas. We wanted to focus on the elements of competitiveness which drive the local economy. To identify the drivers, uh, we had consultations with the local stakeholders like uh, mayor, business associations, enterprises, and we also referred to secondary data. This gave a rough idea of the drivers uh, in each municipality. Working with the pilot municipalities helped us understand the drivers uh, more clearly. And then we synthesized our findings on these drivers across municipalities and uh, came up with five drivers that seem more common across municipalities and then developed indicators around those that can be monitored over time. Um, for example, when we assess service provision in a municipality, uh, we assess if uh, there is a service or information center in the municipality. Uh, whether the services are digitized and if municipality uh, staff has the capacity to provide this information or services. And we also ask why. Uh, for example, why the service is not digitized. So dividing the broad drivers into uh, some specific indicators uh, help us to monitor them over time and then integrate the findings at intervention and uh, strategic level. So over to you, Ellie. So you had a very clear idea of the overall change you wanted to make. And during that pilot phase, you came down to those drivers. And then using those drivers, you developed indicators that will help you understand if those drivers are changing over time. How do you know if those drivers are working together to promote local economic competitiveness? Thanks, Ellie. I think this is, uh, this is an important and interesting question to see uh, whether the different drivers are working together to promote this overall local economic development uh, and competitive, competitiveness within the municipalities, we look at the links among them. For example, in one municipality, which is called Shibganj, 
the local economy was is driven by the mango sector. However, previously there was no structured place in the municipality for trading mangoes. During the mango season, the traders used to sit on both sides of the road in the city and uh, this used to create traffic congestion accidents. The municipality with support from the project developed the infrastructure of the mango market and formed a committee for managing the market. Also, the farmers were introduced to good agricultural practices and later were linked to the national level e-commerce companies, retail stores for selling their mangoes. So these initiatives uh, has uh, these initiatives have improved the business environment uh, for the mango growers and enable, enable them to attract more buyers and sellers. Also, the municipality is uh, earning more revenue from this improved market than ever before. So there we can see uh, signs that the economic system as a whole in the municipality is improving. So you've looked Over at you. so you've looked at how not only about whether each driver is changing, but also how the drivers reinforce each other to help right. each one improve, and then the whole economic competitiveness to improve. Thanks, Rosanna. So Ritesh, it all sounds so very easy, but it can't have been. What are the challenges that you've encountered in getting information on system change, and what did you do about them? Ritesh, you're muted. Uh, thanks, Ellie. Hi, everyone. This is Ritesh again from uh, Grow Library. Uh, I think we all face challenges in getting information on uh, assessing system change. Uh, two challenges that I faced. Uh, firstly, there were lack, lack of information, second information on the cocoa sector. And secondly, uh, non-partners were, uh, I would say, are usually reluctant to share information. And I faced this especially in the beginning. So how did we overcome these challenges? Uh, as part of implementation, we worked uh, very closely with the Liberia Cocoa Exporters Association, uh, which has been an active association in, in here in Liberia, and also the government regulatory body, LACRA. As these relationships developed over time, it got easier to get information from them. For example, it was easier for us to get information on full list of exporters and their contact details from LACRA. Uh, over time, uh, GROW has also invested in and shared a lot of resources uh, with the Exporters Association. And some of these resources include uh, the standardized GAP manual, uh, the Exporters Guide, uh, Premium Market uh, Research Study, and Pathway to a Certification. And if you are working in the cocoa sector and interested in these resources, you can uh, find these on uh, GROW's uh, website. Sharing these resources with the exporters helped us to build trust over time, and they were more open to sharing information even when they were not our direct partners. So I would say that this made it easier for us to get information on uh, basically number of exporters investing in systems to meet premium market demands, actual investment that has gone in quality improvement, feasibility systems, certification or central processing, uh, information on quality of cocoa that has been traded, sales volume and their target markets, whether it's premium market or bulk market, and information on sale price and prices paid to farmers. Obviously wanted to see increase in price paid to farmers. So we also used other informal discussions, mostly during uh, cocoa working groups, which was made up of uh, private, public, and also donor groups. Uh, this helped us to get information on what other programs working in the sector were looking at. Uh, for example, we learned there was another NGO that was considering to support a producer group with uh, organic certification. So we found that it is possible to get information on system change from the organizations that we work uh, with as part of imp uh, implementation. I think uh, we should try to build a good working relationship with these organizations and uh, need to make sure that we use the opportunities that we have as meetings or other conversations to ask the right questions to get all the system change information that we need. Thanks, Ali. So it sounds like you really work to build relationships in the cocoa industry as part of implementation, but also that helped you get information and that you took the opportunities during implementation to also gather information on how the systems were changing. Yes. Thanks, Ritesh. So Isla, MDF has been implementing in Fiji for quite some time now. How have you gathered information on system change and 
really, how have you made sense of it and what it means for MDF? Um, thank you, Ali. This is again Isla. Um, so there were a couple of different um, data gathering practices, but I would say our standard one has been getting the info through a combination of regular monitoring visits or impact assessments and dedicated research, for example, what's happening in the sugar sector generally. Uh, through regular monitoring and in formal, formal all or less formal interviews with key informants, we started realizing that our innovations have started working, but um, that they have started reinforcing each other. So, um, but we also saw, we, we started at least noticing some bigger changes occur occurring and we couldn't connect whether it was due to MDF or, or something else. But, and they were happening in the ways that both, in the both ways that we have anticipated and completely unanticipated. So um, what we did throughout the years is just record everything that we have, um, that we have noticed. And I just wanna make sure to point out, this was not a flashy recording. This was not a perfect way of data gathering pr principles. It was messy and it was user friendly, but we just wanted to dot everything that we found on the way that was mildly interesting. So after a couple of years, when we sat down annually just to track what, what we have gathered so far, we, we saw that we could, we sat down and we saw, oh, we might have enough to make a story out of this. So we devised a research plan that wanted just to understand that better, our assumption whether we have enough. Uh, so we went through previous dribbles, doodles, and uh, both to remind ourselves what we went through, but also what role did MDF play in each of those changes that we have noticed. And that was a crucial step for us, understanding that the process was neither linear nor easy, and that some changes happened and then some stopped happening, and that was a, just a vicious circle of changes. And that was crucial because sometimes we ended up being frozen by this mess of information. And just because you don't know where to start, it's just easier not to start. So what we, what we decided to do, we overcame that paralysis by saying, just let's see a couple of people. Let's see people that we know. And we asked them one question, who helped you along the way and why, what happened? And then we used their responses as leads to where we should go next. So there was no elaborate. We just went out there in a very messy way, but we found out that that was still better than doing a very comprehensive, very detailed research. Thank you so much. Great, thanks a lot, Isla. And I just wanna uh, point out that this, uh, this story of, of messiness that ended up with really understanding system change in the Fiji sugar sector has been put into a case study by MDF, uh, which is really fascinating read if you have a moment. So what I'm hearing is that all three of these programs are effectively gathering and using information on system change. It hasn't always been a perfect process, there's been challenges, but it has been good enough for them to adapt and improve their strategies. Now we'd like to hear questions and comments from all of you attending, and I'll hand it over to Mike to moderate that. Hello. Um, that was great, guys. Thank you so much. Yes, I, I forgot to say at the beginning that we are really encouraging you to put those questions in the Q&A box. And luckily, lots of people have started to do that. So we've already got seven questions there, but I'm sure there are lots more. So please to take this opportunity. We're gonna spend the next um, 25 to 30 minutes talking, answering questions and um, addressing your, your, the priority issues that you're interested in. So um, please make the most of this opportunity. Um, Ali, you, um, you, you didn't really touch on the fact that a lot of the, the thinking that's been described in this webinar has been already codified in the pragmatic approach to assessing systemic change, a whole series of resources that are available on the, the Beam Exchange and which, in fact, Isabel has already posted some links in the chat box to right at the beginning of this webinar. But um, the, the, this, this, these three cases that Ali's been presenting haven't come out of nowhere. They're, the, what links them together is a very um, interesting set of resources and training processes that Ali and colleagues have been running on how to assess systemic change. So that's worth mentioning, I think, before we go into some of the questions. 
So the, the links to those resources are, are now in the chat, by the way. So yes, um, let me start with a very practical question since this is a pragmatic approach we're talking about. Um, maybe Ritesh, you could let us know what, what's involved operationally in doing all of this? What kind of resources, what kind of staffing structure, what kind of budgets did your program need to have in place in order to undertake this kind of system, system change um, assessment process or begin getting it started at least? Uh, thanks, uh, Mike. Uh, I would say that we actually uh, didn't spend additional resources to assess uh, system change because uh, what we actually did was we built it into our MRM system uh, from the beginning. Uh, we were also lucky that uh, there were not many exporters, only about 10 to 12, uh, uh, and they were all based in Monrovia, the main capital city where our, our program was also. So, uh, and then over time, like I said, we were able to develop relationships with all of them uh, through the Exporters Association, including those we didn't partner up with directly. So this means that we didn't spend much time or resources uh, to get information because it was built in our system. We also included in our MRM plans uh, to get information from non-partners. So this was done uh, during imp implementation of activities in the field or even direct monitoring and impact assessments. And by getting information on system change together with uh, other activities, we were able to uh, save time and, uh, and money. And like I've said, like we have benefited from having a good reputation of being a resource base or a knowledge center for the cocoa sector, uh, which give us added opportunities to interact with the uh, various market actors in the, in the cocoa sector. Thanks, Mike. Thank you very much. So that's very that's very interesting. I mean, you you've already talked about this a little bit, but maybe some others, one of the others, can mention it. But there's a question about how to how to garner this kind of information when you're dealing with very informal systems. I mean, actually, Ritesh, you you explained this in some detail when you were talking about the Grow Liberia experience. But maybe one of, maybe one of the other speakers could mention about how this this challenge of 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 kind of capturing information in informal systems. It's a question that came from Sigrid Meyer in, in um, Benin, actually, but uh, perhaps other countries also have the same challenge. Rosanna, have you encountered that issue in the LED work in terms of things are quite informal and you need to get information on them? Yeah. No. So in our case, yeah, of course, I mean, we are working with local stakeholders who does not have a lot of sensitization towards this, uh, uh, you know, systemic way of analysis and everything. So, yeah, of course, I mean, the systems are informal, the people have limited capacities. So that's why I think we are very much focused also on the this participatory process. Uh, so from the very beginning, we engage the stakeholders, so we try to, uh, you know, apply simple tools, maybe, maybe they they don't understand complicated tools. But you know, when we, uh, when we tell them that, okay, uh, in in a particular area, can you come up with some problems or potentials that you you observe? Then they can quickly come up with some of the issues, and from there we can you know identify that okay these are the pressing issues that we need to address maybe or these are the issues which need more longer term strategic considerations. So I think uh, the key is to uh, first I maybe having a having a simple template, simple tools maybe which help us to gather the information from the local stakeholders and then coming back and trying to analyze those and trying to integrate those in the existing MRM system, in the intervention, in the MRM plan. That way, uh, we can also monitor this over time. So, so um, Ayla, what happens if you don't have like if your if your program hasn't really got a systems framework or a systems analysis as part of the sort of design how how do, can you kind of bootstrap this on later on what's the what's the kind of your your advice really about how to sort of get system diagnosis into a program that's maybe not been designed around it um hi everybody yes um i would my my our team would always say better late than never uh, that is often, you know, the 
things that gets that happens as any other thing that happens you know we sometimes miss getting the baseline we sometimes miss we sometimes think that we have enough but then down the way realize that we may not have enough for a baseline so what has been our approach because it happens more often than not to be honest uh what was our approach is to get it um to recollect what we whatever we could at 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 any stage when we realized we don't have enough and moreover we realized through that process the stakeholders actually actually remember longer than we give them credit for maybe not to a hundred percent but at least we will have something that we will we are going to be able to at least say you know how much we have contributed to the process if attribution becomes a problem because the baseline wasn't properly done or the system wasn't properly assessed at the very beginning. Okay. And are there issues, Ali, maybe you can address this. I mean, how do you decide what the threshold is for whether something is a sort of systemic issue or not? Is there a kind of clear boundary between, if you like, the helicopter view and the intervention view? I think that we've been looking for that boundary for quite some time, but having looked at lots of programs, I think it's context specific and it's really dependent on the boundaries that of the system that the program sets. And I think in a practical sense, we're getting too caught up on this issue. I think what, what we've seen from today that the examples are instructive. The GROW team wanted to see a shift in Liberian cocoa from selling in bulk markets to selling in premium markets. And they had those five key changes that they were looking for. You see the same sorts of similar thing in MDF. They wanted to see a shift in Fiji sugar. And they knew the three factors that contributed to that. And the parallel is there with Prabriti as well. They want to see a shift in the economic competitiveness of a single municipality. And they've identified the five changes that are going to drive that. And those are contextualized to each municipality. So the really critical thing here is that they are all clear on what they want to see at a big picture change and the components that need to change, the different parts of the system that need to change to contribute to that bigger picture change happening. And I think if we concentrate on that, on defining system change that way, then it becomes much easier and more pragmatic to actually assess, are those changes happening? How are they happening or not happening? Why are they happening or not happening? And that lays the groundwork for that regular getting information, which is so vital to adapting strategies and, and to their changing context and improving them to be more effective. So there's, a, there's, a, there's a, an interesting question, challenging question. It's the first one the Marcus General put, put in the Q&A box. Um, how you, you talked it right at the beginning of that slide, Ali, about the desired state of the system, you know, what, what you're trying to, the shift that you're trying to achieve, but who defines that desired state and um, in practice, you know, so it will be interesting to hear from the three cases, you know, what the, um, what stakeholders were and how stakeholders, stakeholders were involved in designing, in determining what those desired states were, or was it something that you just as outside agencies just came in and said, well, we obviously can see it ought, ought to be this. How did it work? Tess, do you want to start first? Uh, thanks, Mike. Thanks, Ali. Yeah, I think uh, I think for us, uh, the advantage we had uh, was like working uh, closely with the Exporters Association. So I would say what we did was like uh, when first we put in uh, work with the uh, producer groups to improve the quality of cocoa, and then we realized that sales to premium market was not happening. Then uh, what we actually did, we did this, uh, did this uh, premium market uh, research study and presented the findings uh, uh, to the Exporters Association of what was out there uh, that the premium market offered. So exporters were aware of like, okay, if we want to go for organic certification, we'll get $300 more per ton. If someone wants to invest in, uh, let's say, fine flavor or specialty market, they would get at least $1,000 more per ton. So then as a group, like they were in a better position of seeing like where they want to see themselves in the next few years or what capacity uh, they had, like in terms of final resources to put into this, right? So if someone has, let's say low capital, they, they could in the first few years aim for traceability system, even, even having a full traceable system would be st still give you $150 more pattern. 
those uh, that has uh, much more or were much more uh, financially strong could go for organic certification. And uh, for everyone's information, like if you are investing in organic certification, let's say with a, a group of thousand farmers, it would cost you roughly about 50 to 60 grand. And, and that's a, a lot of money for a small uh, local exporter. And then if someone who wants to go to fine flavor market, which is the highest paying market, you need to do like uh, really intensified central processing, which means you have to buy wet cocoa from farmers instead of uh, dried cocoa. And then you need to you need to have more resources. So I would say we, we work closely with exporters to decide like where they wanted to see themselves in the next few years. And then those who were ready, like we supported, like we work on cost sharing basis, so we supported some of them to cross that line. So it, it wasn't like us telling them that, no, you need to invest in organic certification and export this many tons of cocoa. It was like working closely with them and, and asking like where they wanted to see themselves. I hope I have answered your question correctly. Isla, you're nodding. Uh, do you want to, to add in? Was it similar for MDF? Thank you, Ali. So uh, thank you, Ali. Thank you, Mike. And thanks for this good, great, great question. Uh, we in MDF have not focused on the desired state as a term because desired state may change due to economic influences outside. COVID hits, your desired state can go from 15 tons of sugar to two tons of sugar, and you can say this was a great job. What we have focused on was underperforming functions. What is going to change and what needs to change? What's the vision of change of that function that will for sure contribute to the growth of the sector or change of the system? So when developing that, we have actually devised the baseline and of course, then the subsequent strategy where we have consulted farmers and definitely other stakeholders. Um, so while, what we realized, the wider the validation of our initial assumptions, the better. But at the same time, you know, we, it is really important to consult and triangulate from as many uh, sides as you can, despite the state of the intervention, even if it's before the intervention. Thank you so much. Persona, uh, it's a participatory process, I think, in PrepRD. Do you want to just elaborate on that a little bit about how the, the, the vision or the desired state system is discussed or determined with municipalities? Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Ali. So what we do that when we uh, enter a municipality, so first we uh, uh, have, a, uh, have an understanding with the mayor. Uh, and the municipal body. And then together with the mayor, we uh, try to uh, invite other local stakeholders to join this process. And initially we try to identify some of the problems, some of the opportunities within that municipality. And when we have, together with the stakeholders, when we have a you know, clearer picture about these are the issues that we need to address, then we try to build a common vision for the municipality and the local stakeholders. So this vision is not set by the project, it's set by the municipality, the mayor, the local stakeholders. For example, in case of Sheep Bunch, the municipality that I was actually talking about uh, earlier. So there the priority sector is mango. And after you know the initial dialogues, the workshops and everything, uh, the municipality and the local stakeholders, they decided that they want to focus more on uh, export readiness. So uh, they are facing competitions from the other mango producing region nationally. So in order to, you know, uh, compete with them or in order to uh, diversify their portfolio, now they want to focus more on the export readiness in maybe next uh, 10 to 20 years. So before that, maybe in immediate future, they focus more on uh, digital marketing, the learning about good agricultural practices, all that. So it's the you know common vision of the municipality. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, I think that I think that does. And um, what what's quite interesting here is that in a way that assessing system change in, in, in the way that, that uh, Ali, you've been promoting through these resources is, is very hard to disentangle from the, the actual processes of, of participatory engagement with stakeholders that you would be doing in the programme anyway, um, which, 
you know, so, so that implies there are various skills that you need to do this as, as implementers or as MRM people. I mean, either way, you, you need that ability to, to kind of engage with people. And there's a couple of questions that relate to this in the, in the, Q, in the, um, the question box. So I was looking at a question, first of all, from Marcus Jennell, um, again, at the beginning, um, about really how, how do you, he's asking the question, how do you move the learning function from the program team, from you guys, into this, into the actual system itself, so that the system is capable of assessing and learning and deciding what the new priorities are and so on. And so that that seems to be the real challenge here. And Thomas Bennett, um, sorry, Burnett, also kind of asked the same question, which is, you know, what what have you learned about how you build the capacity of state of those stakeholders within the system to drive and sustain innovations and system change? Because it seems to me these are essentially the same question. Isla, you want to take a stab at that one? Go ahead, Isla. Well, I was about just to raise my hand. Um, thank you. That's a great one. And we have struggled with it. Um, for some time, there were two main reasons. The, 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 for example, the private sector in the instance of tourism, uh, the example that I have given, they have had a good understanding that they need to invest in this market intelligence and data for decision making. But since they were struck with COVID, they had no funds to invest. So for us, it was really important that they are, uh, even though we are investing in that process, uh, in the research, that they are taken along the way so that we invest in their capacity building and understanding how research contributes to better decision making, be it MDF, be it the private sector company in this instance, or the, the wider industry. So what uh, si since that happened, they have actually realized the value of it and they have um, done the research of the, so we have supported them to do markets of Australia and New Zealand, and they have since then uh, decided to invest in researching the North America by themselves. So even when, so our, our experience was, it doesn't have to be always like that, but even if you, they're, they're not able to commit any funds, if you truly believe in that, in that innovation, take them along the way teach them, build their capacity, because ultimately the project exit will happen and the innovation must remain. Thank you. Rosanna, did you want to add? Yes, I, I would like to compliment uh, with uh, what Ayla said. So uh, in Probriti, I mean, from the very beginning, we think that we are going to exit. And uh, for that, we engage the stakeholders from the very beginning. but. Also, what we try to do, we try to um, work with some organizations, for example, uh, the municipality who dedicate uh, their resources uh, uh, to the project so that their capacity is built uh, throughout this process. And also we work with the business associations where the people are uh, getting sensitized, getting uh, you know capacitated so that they can actually uh, have the skill set to analyze their local economy over time when the project will not be there. So, uh, of course, I mean, initially the local stakeholders, they might not have the understanding or skills uh, for uh, doing this, but throughout the process, if we can introduce some simple simple tools, if we, if we can show them the incentive for learning, they, of course, they learn and they try to continue that. That's what we are observing in our uh, partner municipalities. Thank you. Um, Ali um, and all of you, it's been it's been really great having these conversations. We are approaching the formal end of the time that we have for this webinar, but um, I feel like there's still quite a lot to talk about. So I'm going to propose that we carry on for a few minutes longer. But um, obviously not everyone may be able to continue, but uh, I'll, I'll, let's let's give us another five or 10 minutes and I will draw a line at the end of that period. So if you're hanging on, don't don't think it's going to go on forever, but please do stay if you can. Um, I, I wanted to come back to, if you like, the principle that you started with, Ali, 
I mean, we you called this webinar Get Started. And, and one of the main points you made right at the beginning of your presentation was this isn't about trying to be perfect and get it, get all the, the, the I's dotted and the T's crossed. It's just about having the courage, if you like, to just dive in and begin to do some work around this problem of assessing systems change. And um, we can easily, when we talk like this, get into some quite technical, challenging questions about um, how you uh, how you empower stakeholders to take on the learning functions and so on. But in a way that that isn't really the that isn't the main point you're trying to make, is it, Ali? You're trying you're trying to say something about just um, having the the courage to do something that begins to address the this issue. Would you like to say a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think I. I think that sometimes we hesitate. First of all, we sometimes think, well, there's no point in trying to assess system change until we're sort of five or six or eight years into the project because it won't be happening. But actually system change happens from day one. It just might not be because of the program initially. And I think we also hesitate because we're not sure. So what, what I've seen in the field is that the programs that get started, even in an imperfect way, they think about, okay, what's the change we wanna have? And let's get information on that as a bigger picture level as we can and the pieces of it. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter if it's not perfect to begin with because they start getting information and they realize, oh, this information is more useful. This is information is less useful. We don't need that, let's build on this. And it's very possible to just get started purely by talking to your implementation partners and other stakeholders in the sector or in the system that you're intervening in. And that information becomes immediately useful. And it's by the practice of it that programs can get better at it. So rather than trying to work very hard to have a perfect way or a perfect framework or a perfect approach right at the beginning, it's better to Think about the change you're having. What questions do your team have about whether that change is happening or not? Start with those questions. Integrate ways to get the answers to those questions into your MRM plans and then learn along the way. And as your program tends, has more and more contribution to the system change, you're also getting better and better. So it's really about getting started. Ideally as early as possible, but as Isla said, it's better late than never. So wherever you are in your program, Now's the time to start if you haven't already. Um, there's a question just come in in the chat from uh, Laura Castrati saying, what, what do you do if the donor is asking for annual targets and you don't have too much time to focus on all these more qualitative efforts um, and elements, sorry, and naturally you focus on, on reaching the numbers? I think I'll start with that, but then I want to throw it to, to yeah. Ritesh as he's coming to the end of his program. Um, I think that we imagine that system change and numbers are, are two different things, but actually they're the same thing. It is through fostering system change that we achieve the targets. So I think we need to not divorce the two. Ritesh, do you want to add to that? Thanks, thanks, Ali. Yeah, and, and, and I think that's a really good question, and we have actually faced that uh, through the life of the program. Uh, initially, we had a very large target, and uh, while we wanted uh, a shift in the library market from uh, bulk to premium, uh, there was also a lot of pressure to uh, reach, let's say, 20,000 farmers. So we put in a lot of resources in working with producer groups and providing uh, uh, backward linkages, supporting with uh, good agriculture practices, so that farmers increase yield, they have a higher yield and better quality cocoa. So that actually happened, farmers benefited, but then we realized that uh, there was no incentives to put in more resources to produce higher quality cocoa because they were not getting higher price for them. And why that was not happening was because sales to premium market was not happening. That means exporters were not in a position to offer higher price. So then, uh, then we discuss internally of like, okay, if you want to uh, uh, do quality improvement in the long run, what's the way? So the, the only way was uh, to make sure that exporters sell to premium market. And if that happens, then they are in a position to offer farmers a higher price. So that's why we continued uh, while in the beginning, we focused on working more with farmers. Uh, then there was a shift of working more with private sectors, uh, do this primary premium market research. 
and then putting systems in place like traceability systems, uh, invest in organic certification or central processing and focus more on partners so that we can build their capacity uh, to trade with premium markets. And now, since that is happening, we can see that they are able to offer higher prices to the farmers. So if you pro if you give me a higher quality cocoa, I'll give you a higher price. And uh, if someone is not producing a good quality cocoa, they see that, oh, that guy is uh, getting more uh, more prices, higher prices. So that incentivizes them to, let's say, continue to produce a better quality cocoa. So I would say that uh, it was a question of sustainability, I would say. It sounds also like you, you have to bring the donor along with you in that, in that learning process so that they understood that, that they needed to shift the strategic focus of the program. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then we have to tell them uh, like why we are doing that. Like if you don't do that, then it's not sustainable. And, and they basically understood and uh, they, then there was like luxury to continue working uh, with uh, let's say small number of partners, uh, higher impact, uh, impact figures in following years were not higher but the depth of changes uh, were there, I would say. Okay. So, um, Ali, let's, we, we, we'll have to wrap up in the next couple of minutes. And I wanted to ask everyone who's uh, still here, thank you for staying on, to fill out the, uh, the, the quick survey form that there's a link in the chat now to tell us what you thought about this webinar. We really appreciate your feedback, um, as well as your questions and, and, your, atten and your attendance. So, um, but there's still there's still uh, 60 people in the room. So, um, Ali, just quickly, can you just talk us through these resources that are now available on this pragmatic approach so that people are aware where they can go for more information? We'll put the links in the chat box again. But yeah, just talk us through what, what we now have available on the Beam Exchange for people who want to dive into this in a bit more detail. So there's a, a number of resources on a pragmatic approach. The first is an overview paper, which is about uh, 20 pages, I think a little bit less, which gives you just kind of an overview of the, the kinds of things we've been talking about today, um, but in a bit more um, detail and out outlining the process, both in terms of defining system change and then thinking about how do we put out the strategy in a way that we can then think about what are the questions and indicators we need to use to assess it how do we actually gather the information? And then importantly, how do we use that and make sense of it? In addition to the overview paper, there's a companion guide called How to Put Into Practice. That's a lot longer and has a lot more detail and worked examples from two programs. So that's not something you'd read from cover to cover, but dip into for different parts of the process and gives lots of nitty gritty details and tips and examples. We have a new resource that came out just this year um, after the 2021 workshop which is a easy user-friendly slide deck with highlights from practice, especially things we've learned since the original approach came out in 2020 from practitioners. And that is also available on the website, as well as a couple of blogs on system change and resilience that complement just how do we think about this. That's fantastic, thank you. Yeah, so all, all, those, uh, all those resources, uh, links are available in the chat now and um, or you can just go to the Beam Exchange site and use the search box, and I'm, I'm sure you'll find them if you put in pragmatic approach and, and, and have a scoot around. Great. Well, look, we have to, we have to draw a line now. Um, thank you so much. It's been a really uh, really engaging webinar, and thank you for the for Mike, the. Mike, Mike, can we can we stop? Yeah. Can we just finish with a few super quick top tips? Oh yes, yeah. You wanted to leave us with a few key notes, didn't you? Yeah. We key did. points. To, yeah. be Please go one ahead. One minute. So. Top tips from our practitioners. Isla, start us off. It's harder than it sounds. Um, have an idea what you want to change, at least an assumption, and just strike it along the way. Farzana, top tip. Um, keep an open mind. Keep asking the right questions. And one of the most important questions could be why things are happening the way they are happening. So keep asking why. Ritesh? Thanks, Ali. I think we need to understand and be very clear uh, what system change we want to achieve. And uh, secondly, we need to gather and review the information on system change regularly. I would say either semi-annually or annually at least, or we may not just adjust fast enough to achieve the system change within a given time frame. So just to sum up, let's not overcomplicate things. 
Let's start with a clear idea of the system that the program is aiming to target and articulate the system change the program aims to have. Outline what you need to know to understand to what extent, how and why those changes are happening, and then integrate those questions into your existing MRM plans. That way you can get that information regularly from different stakeholders during implementation and MRM activities. And most important, use information as you get it to adapt your strategy and interventions. So just before Mike closes, I do want to thank very much the panelists. And I wanna thank all of you for your great questions. And I am looking forward to seeing more and more examples of assessing system change from all of us. Thank you, Ali, and uh, thank you, Isla, Ritesh, Fazana. Really great webinar. I've, I've really enjoyed it, and I'm sure everyone else has too.